Uh, I have found it very difficult to communicate the 10 years of learning that I had living with uh, uh, forest lands. I will not use the technical terms that I used today, uh, which is Adivasis, Indigenous, and I will, I will discuss these terms by and by. But uh, literally, I have lived with forest lands for several years. Uh, in which a lot of things changed within me. I learned a new language. Uh, and to learn the new language, it took me at least three to four years. Uh, and I went there basically to do my doctoral thesis from the School of Economics in sociology. And uh, the terms and conditions of the doctoral thesis were existing. My mentor, uh, Ashish Nandi and Professor Ubroy, <coughs> Uh, indirectly and directly told me that there are three things that you need to do if you want to do a doctoral thesis with us. Uh, never directly, but in the course of conversations, this is the message that I got. The first is that you have to learn a new language. Second, you have to learn the new language without a mediator, without an informant, without a translator. And third, your thesis is complete when your ideas are mature. In the same way as a papaya or a mango falls down from a tree when it's ripe, similarly your thesis will fall down once your ideas are mature and it doesn't really matter how long you take. Five years, 10 years, 25 years, uh, we don't know how ideas mature. So that's the, the basic three rules that I had to uh, follow in order to do my thesis. Uh, and I began to search for a place where I can go. Uh, I did not follow conventional methods in anthropology, which is that you do a proper survey of the areas that you want to go to, you collect some data, and you like a, like, a, you know, like you do in war, you then charge, and you move on to the place where you want, with some basic information. My course of action, my course of movement was basically de determined by a very simple question, and the question was, how do we know the finality of development and the world that we live in? Critically, we can't know it because there's arguments for and against it. The only way we could do it is find out a place where there were no development inputs. And by that we mean simply there is no electricity, there is no water, there are no development programs, there is no irrigation. And how was one to find such a place? Common sense told me that such a place would be really a backward place because that's how these places are classified. A backward place is one where there is none of these. So you start to look for backward places. And somebody, I mean in the course of making conversation, somebody said, why don't you go to Bastar? So I went to Bastar. And in Bastar, the only thing I told people was, I want to learn a new language. And that's why I'm here. So everybody directed me to the right man who would teach me the new language. And by a lot of errors and mistakes and a lot of hard work, and I, I can't go into the details because it's a very long story, uh, I landed up in a place called Ahuzmar. So somebody said, oh, you need that place? That is a place where you will find nothing. People still live in loincloths. Abhi patte ke kapde pehenge ghoomte hain. Bas tumko wahi jaga tumhari badi hai tumhari chale. So I made my journey to Abhuzmar. And it was not a simple journey because I could not enter Abhuzmar because it was a protected place. And it was not biosphere reserves, any nature reserves that you have today. It was not a sanctuary, it was not a biosphere reserve, none of these. I had to go to the home department in Bhopal. Uh, Swamiji, who was a great painter at that point in time, had just started to make the Bhopal Bhavan. And he blessed me saying that you please go Jagdish Swaminathan. Jay Swaminathan. He was a painter, he was starting with Bhopal Bhavan and he had just visited the outskirts of Ujwar and he said, you please go and you have my blessings. You were wonderful people. I was very encouraged and I landed up there. And I stayed there for five years. Because the rule of my research was that I don't need an interpreter. And uh, the <coughs> politics of the interpreter is very simple and straight. What they will tell me and what they will translate, I have no way to take. They will sift out information, they will translate words wrongly. Therefore, the idea was to learn a new language, you have to get to the sensibility of the word. You have to understand the phonetics of the word. You have to get the texture of the word. 
in order to know the nuances of what the word actually means, more than the literal translation. I think that was the methodological principle that I followed when I learned the language. It took me about three years to learn the language, and then two more years to get into the depth of uh, what it is. And my problem was very simple. How do the people living in the forest think of the forest? What is the theory of the forest? <coughs> and the only way I could do that is to see a reflection of this theory in the practices that they do. Uh, and I would say that uh, I was told to ask them the theory and I thought that was the wrong way of doing it because in their tradition, this mode of knowledge, of question and answer, is not their mode of acquiring knowledge. And I think that's a very fundamental difference between uh, our way of acquiring knowledge and their way of acquiring knowledge. <laughs> How do they do it? We'll come to it as we, as we go along. So I stayed there for five years and I learned the language. <clears throat> and I learned several things in their language. And the problem that I faced was to translate my thinking which was now in their language into first normal Hindi or English and then into a conceptual language of anthropology <coughs> and I have failed miserably to do that. I have written a few articles and what I am going to tell you today is also with great difficulty because I still do not have the right vocabulary to say what I want to say but I will try nevertheless. One of the things that I tried to do here was to learn about plants. And uh, I did not want to learn about plants using modern botany. So I did not want to go and look at the different kinds of leaf there are, different kinds of flowers there are, you know, whether it is a monocotyledon or a dicotyledon. I just didn't want to learn the vocabulary. I wanted to learn the plants the way they would want to teach me plants. And I didn't succeed. In the course, several things and several questions have come to my mind some of which I am going to share today. Uh, I will come to that knowledge uh, subsequently because I think we need to travel a certain amount of intellectual distance in order for me to make sense to uh, you. I need to uh, do a little bit of decommissioning of some of the thoughts that we have about these people in order to make you available to some of my ideas. Uh, it may be unnecessary for a lot of people but I think uh, it would be necessary in order to wrap out my uh, information and understanding uh, in some appropriate way. Uh, first thing I notice is that that knowledge comes to them without physics, chemistry, biology and mathematics. And that was very, very fascinating for me. How does a body, how does a people actually acquire this knowledge without the basic sciences? I have tried this question at many forums after I came to Delhi, with many scientists, with conservators of forests, with botanists, and the only answer I got was that it is basically hit and try. My little reading of history and philosophy of science and practices of science they also tell me that they also have a method of hit and trial. Only thing is that they document the hit and trial in some measurable documented form where we call probability. They know how to document it, they know how to study it, and therefore they have this power of the document in order to say. So I thought that was not a valid reason to accept that you know this is basically hit and trial. What they meant was it's accidental. And my contention is that no, it is not accidental. There is a method to it. And that method we have to call out as academics. There is a method in everything that we do, and everybody is not self-conscious of the method which they follow in generating the knowledge that they have. The whole idea of social sciences actually emerges from this possibility of actually being able to reflect on everyday practices in order to derive principles which you use and create a specialized body of knowledge which we call the scientific knowledge. So I kept running with that question and then came the intellectual property right regime and there is no mention in that regime of the process of discovery that regime totally neglects or overlooks or willfully undermines the possibility that there is a method to this discovery and that method needs to be honored and that method needs to be included in the intellectual property right regime. Why do they not recognize this method is the question which I will address but one more point of fact. 
we need to ask this question for one other very important reason. On record by botanists is the fact that we only know one twentieth or one hundredth of the knowledge of the biodiversity that exists in fact. The question is, does modern science have the equipment, both intellectual and technological, to actually research the 99% of the knowledge that they don't have? And what guarantee do, they, do we have that they do have that expertise? I will describe to you very shortly what modern science does and why is it not capable of doing it. And why, therefore, it is very important for us to understand and recognize and accept that there is a method in Adivasi way of looking at the plant world. And I think this is a very difficult question because most people will not even want to recognize this question, that this is even a valid question. Because there are a whole lot of presuppositions which we have been socialized into, which we are not willing to get rid of. If we don't get rid of those presuppositions, it is not possible even to recognize that this is an important question. To accept that this is an important question means at least three things. That they did find out, we have to accept that, that there is a method to find out, and that the method is learnable, and that modern science has not been able to do it. If we accept this question, we have to accept these three subsequent subsidiary propositions. Only then can we actually agree to talk about this. If somebody tells me, as some people have, you first prove to me that they have knowledge, then we start to discuss, I don't think that's the way it can go. We have to first accept that there is a body, there is a methodology. Once this is acceptable, then we can begin the discussion. Otherwise, there is no scope of discussion at all. With that, I come to the point, this is therefore an exercise not only to prove that Adivasis have but to also study the method of sciences as well. This is a very important point because unless we include the discussion in not generating knowledge as recorded, but as a method, as a problem of method, this discussion will not go any further. And when I say it's a problem of method, what I'm trying to say is that method is not only concerned in generating knowledge which we can use, method is also concerned with examining itself in terms of its appropriateness and reliability in the task that it assigned itself to do. For instance, we need to ask how appropriate are the methods that are available to us in the tasks that we want them to perform. This is a very important discussion in natural sciences, but not in social sciences. Instrumentation is a very important branch of natural sciences, where they will create a new instrument each time they want to go deeper. Right? And there is a whole lot of proof of it. That every time we want to know something deeper, you look at the Higgs bosom, look at the huge machine that they have created in order to study particle physics. Right? I think this is a this is a this is not the monopoly of natural sciences. This is a problem of methodology which extends across all sciences. So my concern here is that what is it in the method that is lacking, which prevents us from recognizing that there is a method in the Adivasi way. I am only talking on the plant world. I am not talking about nuclear physics, I am not talking about cancer, I am not talking about mass. I am just talking about one limited area of knowledge, which is the plant world and the human body. And it would be unfair to expect, you know, Adivasis to talk about nuclear physics. Only then can you recognize that there is a method in what they say. I think that's a very unfair demand and it does not stand to any kind of money. Uh, having said that, uh, few small points about what is the method of the sciences uh, and what is the problem with these methods which cannot lead us to understand or even consider this question far apart get into understanding uh, what this uh, knowledge is all about. I want to describe to you first the whole politics of creating biosphere reserves or reserves of nature that we have today and then link it to the whole question of uh, ethnobotany uh, the whole question of fifth and sixth schedules, to the whole question of Forest Rights Act 2006, and to PESA 1996. I think this is part of a larger package, which shares the same methodology, 
and which derives from a particular view of method given to us by one particular version of what constitutes to be science and reason. The first thing about biodiversity reserves or reserves of nature is that it's a creation of capital for a very, very specific reason. The rate or the speed at which industrial production happens is astonishingly fast because that's the nature of the technology and that's the nature at which capital needs to reproduce itself. <coughs> Accordingly, what happens is that the rate at which nature can regenerate itself is not as fast. So if they continue to extract at that speed, very soon nature will not be able to keep up with that pace. Nature has a different rhythm altogether. How do you bridge this gap? So what you do is you create biosphere reserves. You create nature reserves, which are called biosphere reserves, wildlife centuries, etc. Et Where what you do is you, you encircle, you territorialize natural capital and say this is the preserve and the property of the state. And what will it be used for? A new science is created <coughs> in order to get the information that they want about plants. And that science is called ethnobotany. What does ethnobotany do? <coughs> ethnobotany basically, ethnobotanists basically go to the indigenous people across the world, go to the Adivasis in India, collect all the information that they have about plants. So typically, a ethnobotanical experience is that on the one hand, you will have local names, on the other hand, you will have Latin names, and on the third hand, you will have a third column which tells you what it is used for, and the fourth column, maybe some anthropologists have contributed to that, you will have folklore, mythologies, culture, where this plant is used. What do they do with this knowledge? They take this knowledge to the laboratory, they test it out in the laboratory, and what do they do in the laboratory? They extract the active principle, which is a formula. They preserve the active principle, try it on species, find it to be efficacious, and patent it. This is what ethnobotanists do. Ethnobotanists will not ask the question, where did you get this knowledge from? How did you generate this knowledge? What are the principles of nature that you observe? What categories do you use? They cannot ask this question because in modern science, there is no scope for asking these questions. A scientist will not even entertain these questions because one, he does not have the conceptual equipment to do it. Two, if he accepts this question, he has to accept that he, he can't do it. And that breaks the monopoly of modern science, totally. They will never accept this question. Right? In fact, you, if you push them too hard, they'll say, look, why do you want them to remain primitive? Why do you want them to remain backward? You know, what is this? You don't want them to grow? You don't want them to uh, benefit from modern society? The benefits of good civilization you have taken, you're not giving it to them. And the discussion ends there. So this is what ethnobotany does. And a good variation of ethnobotany, I think, which I think the government of India has propagated very, very strongly, is to make biodiversity resistance. It is of no value to Nadiwasi. He only has a book. Right? And what is the book doing? The book is making available all the information that you need to a multinational corporation who would then know where to go to identify that plant. What does Adivasi do with that? Nothing. He just is very proud. They look, now I have a documentation of so many species in my forest. Right? But if you ask this Adivasi, if you ask this tribal, then can you now tell me how to produce it? He cannot. And this is something that I want to discuss now and tell you who are these Adivasis who have this knowledge. As a friend journalist who is sitting here who pointed out to me, when there are only Adivasis, only tribals, and I insisted there are two different sets of people. In English, we translate Adivasi into tribal, but it's only a translation. If you look at the historical epistemologies of these three words, Adivasi, indigenous, and tribal, they are very, very different epistemologies. So who is a Adivasi and who is a tribe? A little bit on that. The Adivasi to me is a forest dweller who lives in the forest, who thinks the forest is his home and his place of work. A tribal is someone who has forest dwellers as his ancestors 
and who has moved out of the forest and has become part of a mainstream civilization over 700 years. The fifth and sixth schedule are part of that whole, the entire project to make them part of the modern world. Fifth and sixth schedules have inherited the legacy of exclusion, partially excluded areas which the British made. What were these areas and how did they come into existence? Adivasis, the forest dwellers were the first to protest against the exploitative forest policies of the British. This is on record. What did the British do? The British argued, the British were now, you know, enlightened people. So they could not rule brutally, they had to rule with the humanity. So they brought all the theories of anthropology that they had learned from one strain of anthropology. And that, I, I, I want to repeat that, there, is, there are other strains of anthropology also which they did not learn from. Uh, these strains come from anarchists uh, who had a completely different idea of anthropology than from anthropologists that supported the mainstream and uh, exploitative systems. And they said, look, they are very innocent people, they are beautiful people, they are lovely in culture, they are wonderful, but they are not ready for modern civilization. Right? And therefore they created these special areas. Politically looked at, this was the first counter-insurgency measure. Why? Because this was a measure to stop the Adivasis from any further rebellion and protest. My argument is, the fifth and sixth schedule is a counter-insurgency measure. It is not a measure for development. The FRA 2006 and the PESA 1996 inherit that legacy and they are equally counter-insurgency <coughs> measures. They are not measures designed to develop people. And there is a very important angle. <coughs> Anything that is designed as a counter-insurgency measure, the first thing it does is to make sure that your voices and your agency is squashed. Unless then it cannot be a counter-insurgency measure. This entire tradition is designed to squash initiative and then do what? You first have to accept that you are primitive and then you can become a member of the fifth and sixth year. What does it do? As you move out of the first and as you begin to become part of the fifth and sixth year regimes, you first lose touch with the first. That has three consequences. First, the language of your workplace, which is the office that you go to, right? which is English or Hindi that you learn, the computers that you work with, depending on where you are positioned in the employment scale, your language of work is very different from the language of your custom and your culture. And what is the language of your culture and custom? It is folklore, it is dance, it is music, it is mythology, it is rituals. There is no link between the two. And third, this might also impact the language of everyday life. Because you are dealing not with the realities of forest, you are now dealing with the realities of finance, of banking, of ration cards, <coughs> of police licensing, in order that you may exist. So these people lose that imagination that comes with the forest. And those who continue to live in the forest, for them all the three languages are embedded in each other. The language of work, the language of home, the language of everyday life is embedded with each other because they are talking about the same set of materials, the same set of ideas uh, in all the three spheres. What is the difference between these two imaginations? To put it very, very simply, I think there is a very big change, there is a very big difference in an imagination where you are living with living things. So imagine that your house is in the middle of a forest where there are animals, where there are plants, where mud is alive, everything is alive. And you imagine yourself, your imagination in a place like this room where everything is non-alive. It's not dead, but it is non-living matter. Right? It makes a substantial difference in the kind of imagination that you have. You are dealing with living things all the time. Your house is built and it dissolves. Here your house is built and it doesn't dissolve. 
this is very important difference which I would like to talk about in order to emphasize that these are two radically different imaginations. When an Adivasi builds his house in the forest and he abandons the house, the forest reclaims the house. It's quite obvious. When in the city we make the house, it may not be reclaimed by nature. You may have an archaeological monument lasting for several hundred years, maybe several thousand years. It is a very, very substantial difference. Why? Because here is a society that does not believe in history that is embedded in archaeology. There are no archaeological monuments in that society to give them sense of time and space. How would this society be if all the archaeological monuments were taken away from them? What would happen to a sense of time and history? We will get demolished totally. We will completely be in a spin, we will go completely mad. What is the sense of time and history? What is the sense of the world that comes to a society where there are buildings, but there is no archaeological sense of history? There is no archaeology to determine the sense of time and space. Compared to a society in which archaeology is a very important determinant of how you think of a time and space. This is the imagination which an Adivasi has, which a tribal doesn't have. I think this is very important. <coughs> Are there any Adivasis left in this world today? Where do we go to look for them? And most of us are of the view that they are not. I think there are several of them. They were few, but I think those few are on the frontier. In the, in the sphere of knowledge, the minority is the frontier. The minority is the one who does the experiment. It is not, everybody doesn't do the experiment. Right? Knowledge is not produced by mass production of experiments. Knowledge is produced by those two people who dare to think of a new idea, experiment with it and die with it. And Adivasis are on the frontier. There is another reason why we need to look at Adivasis on the frontier. Today, the criteria for development is not only GDP. It is whether you are in debt and whether your carbon footprint is zero or not. Right? And I think Adivasi society can be looked at as one society where carbon footprint is zero and there is no debt. If we were to use this parameter and redraw the hierarchy of societies, I would say Adivasis are on top and America is at the bottom because America does not sign the carbon protocol and it is the most in debt. If you look at the debt clock, it is deep, deep, deep red. Now, does that mean that we become Adivasi? Certainly not. But certainly we can learn from them. And what is it that we want to learn from them? Is something that I want to share with you now. We can learn from them that deforestation is not about just the loss of forest cover. Deforestation is a much deeper phenomenon. From their point of view, deforestation is the deforestation of the mind. Now what does that mean? It means that if you look at your mind as a world in which there are many objects of nature, right? There is a very, very, very good painting done by a, a Latin American painter. I wish I could have shown that. So the painting shows a man and a big circle over his head. And in this circle, all that he is thinking about has been drawn. Everything. And it, all that it contains is consumer goods and nothing else. Deforestation means that in that worldview, you have no place for a tree. And the proof of that is, in our everyday lives, if we were to calculate how much space and how much time we give for trees, it is not even one-tenth of a day, not even one-hundredth of a day. That is the deforestation of the mind. And that is what deforestation is. Because that deforestation corresponds to the actual destruction of plants in the natural world. They also say, the deforestation has very another very important dimension. We are not only concerned with the number of species that we've lost, we are also concerned with the potentiality of Earth to have been totally destroyed. In other words, the fertility of the Earth has been totally destroyed, and in today's language, I would say that is destruction of potentiality. And this is a very important concept that I want to emphasize. Potentiality is not to be understood as opposed to 
that which is possible. Potentiality is eternally potential. The moment we actualize it, it ceases to be potential. That is actual. This is a uh, idea that's not mine. It's a idea that has been developed by uh, Ambain in his book called Potentiality. It's a very nice. It's a very difficult book to read. Uh, but I think the central idea of the book is potentiality eternally potential. Now, if you destroy this potentiality, that's that's deforestation. A friend of mine, uh, who's a Gandhian farmer, put it very well to describe potentiality. Somebody asked him, "What do you want to leave behind in this world? What is your contribution to the next generation?" He said, "I want to leave one inch of topsoil. That's what I want to contribute to the next world, and it is a very difficult task." What all social engineering, what all politics, what all economics you will have to do, what all philosophy you will have to create, to create a one inch of topsoil is at least to me a huge task. And I think what he is contributing to is potentiality. I think that is the meaning of potentiality that we are looking at. So where does the potentiality lie? How would the forest dwellers define potentiality? It comes to us as part of their cultivation practice. And I want to say here that shifting cultivation is a wrong way of understanding what the forest dwellers do. That is a colonial way of understanding the practice. And we have continued to destroy that practice by continuing to discuss it under the title of shifting cultivation. Shifting cultivation only talks about the plot in which the crop is being sown. But there is only one fourth of the story. Very briefly, a shifting cultivation cycle varies depending on the number of plots you have. So you move from plot 1 to x number of plots. Let's say if you have, in the time that I went, everybody had 28 plots. So you move from plot 1 to plot 28. And while one plot is being cultivated, 28 plots are lying fallow. Actually, forest is regenerating on the 28 plots. So actually, shifting cultivation is wrong. It is the cultivation of a forest that is what is happening in shifting cultivation. You are actually nurturing a forest because that is the large amount of time that you are creating for forest regeneration. And believe me, not all forest is cut. The forest that is not cut is called the sacred forest. And that sacred forest is where Mother Earth lives. The Mother Earth is not just a metaphor. It is not just a simple literary way of describing the properties of Earth. It stands for a very important principle. And the principle is that it describes to you the other side of labor. If you were to understand Marx's theory of labor, Marx says very clearly that you can only own the products of your labor. What Adivasis are telling us is, what about the products that are not a product of your labor? You can't own them. And that is earth. That is nature. How do you relate to that labor which is not your own? That is the crux of this practice. We call it common property resources, but common property resources does not capture the spirit. Because common property resources does not talk about potentiality. It is talking about territoriality, it is talking about land ownership, but a different mode of sharing. Here they are saying you have no business to even think of ownership of land. What is your job? Your job is as caretakers only. Now, what does caretaker mean? I won't need to go into that, but I just want to say, I just want to give you the parameters of the imagination that comes to you when you're living with living things. First, your time cycle changes. You are not talking of a yearly cycle that happens in the financial year. You're talking of a 48-year time cycle. Which is divided into units because which are of two lunar cycles. So you move from one cultivation plot to another in two lunar cycles, not in one lunar cycle. So imagine your time unit is not one one year, which is 365 days. That's very arbitrary. You know, we can always change time to different measures that we want to. So their time scale is two lunar years. And what kind of mindset would have two lunar years? as a scale to plan daily activities is something that we have to imagine. I mean, unless we go there, uh, the only way to do it is to imagine it. What else does it do? 
an average Adivasi keeps in mind at least 10 life cycles in his head. At least 10. Otherwise, he cannot live in a forest. Which tree, to, which root is ready to eat at what time of the year? Which tree has fruited last year? Which tree is going to fruit next year? How many times can I uh, take harvest from this plant? Number of plants that he has to use either through food gathering or through any other way, each of these time cycles is in his head. And these time cycles vary from annual to generational. When they make their gods, they make them from trees. And these gods are never made again unless the wood dies. Right? And they have to have that particular tree from which this god is made for the god to exist. They have to keep a time cycle of that tree and of this god. This is the other time cycle they live in. What this time cycle means is that their span of observation, their unit of observation is more than a generation. The unit of observation is not time clock. I observe a plant only when it is right. That's what modern botanists do. They will observe a plant over one generation. And the result of that observation is an Adivasi can identify a plant just from the smell of the smoke, just from the look of a burnt wood, just from the look of a broken twig. Modern botanists can't do it. They just can't do it. It also means that the space that they have for observation is at least to the same scale as the time they are able to observe. And what happens in that space is something that I will tell you now. And I think uh, there are some interesting stories that you may find fascinating. This is now about uh, medicine. Having said all this as a background, now we can discuss actually what Adivasi medicine is all about. And I will begin by a few examples in order to draw your attention to what we are going to engage with. In one of my trips uh, with my friends, I was carrying an axe and I didn't know how to hold an axe. So I put the axe and sat on it. The axe, I got up and the axe moved around and scooped out this much of flesh from my upper thigh. And this was mid monsoon. It was infested, there was pus, was feverish, and I couldn't walk. An old man comes, looks at me, asks me to wait, goes to the next door forest, brings a bark, chews it, fixes it there, and in five days' time I'm up and about. I'm here. I don't have to do anything. My first question, how do you know this? My first experience of, of time with medicine. Second example, a friend of mine had fever. I, as a modern man, took my temperature, thermometer, number 104. I said, please go to a doctor. Mid-summer, he goes on to a rock, extremely hot, lies around it. I said, look, you are lying on a hot, burning rock. He said, no, that's the only way we cure a fever. Two days later, his fever is gone. Another friend of mine, he was lying with his foot swollen this big. What had happened? He was running in the forest to chase a bear and a bamboo this big had got into his feet from under the foot and right up to his uh, calf like this and he, he just didn't know what to do and it was swollen like this. When I went there, it was so painful that even when I looked at it, he would shriek. So I said, look, my modern mind, come, I'll take you to the hospital, become gangrenous, you'll have to cut your leg. He says, you go. So I went, two days later I came back, he was walking. I said, what did you do? He said, it took me one day to prepare my mind. And the second day, I pushed the bamboo with my thumb so that one tip could come out. It took me the whole day to push the bamboo stick out. I prepared my mind for another day. And the next day, I pulled it out. All done by himself. The pus came out. He walked to the forest, picked up some herbs, put it on that, and it was fine. For example, a very senior shaman, the medicine man, was bitten by a snake. And I was, he was my neighbor, I was told about this, I went and saw him, he was healing it himself. 
he healed himself of a poisonous snake bite in one month's time. And what was his principle? No water to drink. Right? He took some seeds and he used to sharpen those seeds, put it on it so that the poison can be sucked out. He was in terrible pain. But no doctors, he healed himself of a poisonous snake bite. I asked someone, how do you do all this? And it's very difficult to get the knowledge from them. And I was told that they were very, very secretive. And I found out it's not secrecy that they are concerned with. Uh, they are really concerned with who is worthy of this knowledge. They don't give this knowledge to any Tom, Dick and Harry because they think that the plants will get angry and they will not have the medicinal properties that they need to have. This was my first debriefing of the fact that what does a living thing actually mean? All living things have intelligence. This is the message that I get. It is for us to have the antenna and the tactility of our senses to recognize those intelligences. So he gave me a way in which he would train someone. He is walking and some young boy is walking with him. And he comes home and says, did you notice what I did? He said, no. Went again, went again. He still didn't notice. I said, what did you do? He took me aside and said, I, while I was walking, I put my toe on one plant. And I wanted him to see what I had done. That man did not notice and he failed the examination. That is the, that, that is the position and the alertness of observation that is required for you to learn the skills. These are, there are a few tests that the shamans perform in order to understand whether you are alert, whether you can absorb, whether you are ready to take or not. My well, last example, I think which is the most important example of all. And <coughs> the conclusion of the example is that Adivasis know the relationship between moonlight and plants. Modern science does not know this. I have tried very hard to find out from scientists what is the relationship between moonlight and plants. I have got no answer. I have searched journals, I have found no research paper. The only research paper I found was somebody said the only way you can study this is to convert the intensity of light into some kind of a figure, reproduce that light or that intensity of wavelength in the laboratory and then see how it behaves. It doesn't work. How did I find this out? So I asked my friend, you have to tell me, uh, this is not something that I will go without. So very secretly he told me, look, you have to go to a plant and ask the plant whether it is ready to come for this particular patient. I said, how do you do it? How do you go and talk to plants? He says, it is all to do with moonlight. Plants, you cannot talk to plants in sunlight. And why? It's a long story, but the, the gist of it is that the plants that we see have an individual and a collective life. This is the theory of a plant. And you need to know when is it that they are in their own active principle. That is the individual life. When they have distanced themselves from the community, not by walking away, by a certain methodology which is available in nature where all plants are into their own self-acting principle, into their own being as it were. And that's the time when you go and talk to your plant. That's when the plant will talk to you. And you have to go in a certain way, you have to prepare yourself in a certain way so that you are available to the plant. And when you go to the plant, the plant will talk to you. And how does the plant talk to you? He says, through my head. How else will you talk to me? So what is it? How does this happen? So he gave me an example. He says, that when we go and settle a new place, how do you think we do it? We, we don't know whether it's a good place or a bad place. Every place is all good. There are many places which have water, which have all other facilities, but that's not enough. We have to take permission from the space. I said, what do you mean? He says, space has intelligence. And we need to know how to read that intelligence. 
only when the space allows it. What does what does the space allowing the space mean? That all the spirits that are living in that space, right? These spirits we call them spirits, but they actually call shadows. All the shadows that are living. Who are these shadows? These are beings that don't have a bodily existence. So there are beings with bodily existence and a shadow, like us and like trees, and there are beings without body. And there are a lot of them in a particular space. We have to ask their permission. And when they give us permission, we settle down. And how do we know they have given permission? We pick up any one element in nature and say, you please speak to us through this particular element. It could be a plant, it could be a tree, it could be a stone. How does that happen? The plant speaks to you through your dreams. The plant will appear to you in a dream. And will tell you that this is the part that you can take, this is how you will prepare it, and this is how you will use it. That was my second lesson of understanding dreams in a different way from which we have learned from Freud. Dreams, according to them, is when the soul, or when the jiva, in their word there is no soul, it's the jiva, when the jiva travels when every other sense is sleep. When you are sleeping, then the jiva travels the world and it brings you images of whatever, wherever it travels and whatever it touches. Right? And it is this jiva that comes to you and tells you what to do. A good proof of that is that there are pataris, singers of narratives, who sing for seven days and seven nights. So I met one of them and I wanted to record their epic of origin. So he called his six jellas and they started to sing. And at the end of seven days, I said, how did you learn this? I said, nobody taught me. I said, then how did it happen? He said, one night it came, all of, all of it came into my head. And next morning I was singing. I said, are you sure? He said, we can't teach this. I mean, how is somebody going to teach me songs which run over seven days and seven nights? That was my third lesson. Which is, if I, if I was to convert the narrative in, in, as an equivalent to the idea, what they are saying is, ideas have an intelligence of their own. They select the person whom which they would like to go to. You don't think. All that you do in your life is to prepare your body to receive those ideas. If your body is ready, then you will get the idea. Otherwise, if it comes to you, you won't even recognize that these ideas are there. The last thing I want to say is that this is a product of hard labor. To be able to dream like this, to be able to observe like this, to be able to uh, diagnose like this, it is not a training in a laboratory which is enclosed. It is very much a product of good hard labor. And hard labor I mean you have to carry so many pieces of wood every day to your home, you have to bear the pain of using an axe. Your hands have to become callous. You have to bleed. Unless then you do not get the sensitivity to understand nature differently. Because it is the body which is the observer, the unobserved. It is the tactility of your skin which will register the observation. It is the clarity of your eyes that will see. So uh, labor is something that transforms the grammar <laughs> of the senses. Without that labor, this grammar cannot be got. So long as modern science is not freed from its alienating labor in the laboratory, so long as science is not able to ready to accept that it is hard physical labor that contributes to generational concepts and observations, until then, this knowledge is not going to be accessible to us. And I think this is a crisis. If we don't get this knowledge, then we are deprived of that huge methodology which modern science and modern man cannot research. We do not have the capacity to move into the forest, live with the plants and discover the properties of plants. And if we don't do that, our modern medical system is going to be atrociously expensive. Right? We are going to lose sense of who we are 
and we are going to lose sense of where the healing comes from. One last story, and this is a very fascinating story, and then I'll end. A friend of mine who's an ethnobotanist, he told his friend, look, I'm going to the forest, you please follow me. He said, you go, I'll finish my work and come. Six hours later, he come, and this is what he tells him. He said, you, you eat there, you rest it there for five minutes, you touched a plant here, you waited here for two minutes, you went and peeped into that bush. And this friend was completely stunned. How did he read such minute signs in the forest to be able to tell him where did he go, what did he do, even to the extent of you touch this plant. He could even see that this man had stopped and touched this plant in order to see what the plant was. That is the nature of engagement. That is the nature of observation that is required. Right? If we surrender ourselves to telescopes or microscopes, we are in a very, very different situation. Thank you.